Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In the previous videos, I've been showing you how you can use the definite integral to answer questions that are arising from geometry, right? We were using the definite integral to find, say, the volume of a three-dimensional object or even the surface area of that object. But we also saw that we can use it to compute uh, quantities such as arc length as well. And in this video and the few that will follow it, we're going to continue this idea of using the definite integral to answer explicit problems. But now we're going to turn ourselves more towards the physics domain. And in particular, in this video, we will focus on how we can compute the work applied to an object and how this can be related to a definite integral. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, when you think about the work uh, or, or just work as an abstract concept, you're probably thinking about some activity that requires a muscular or mental effort, right? It might even be you know, doing your homework for this class. But in, in science and in particular in physics, uh, the term actually refers specifically to a force acting on an object and the object's subsequent displacement. Okay, so we have a very, very different or maybe more narrow definition of work that we're going to be, uh, excuse the pun, working with throughout uh, this lecture and the few that will follow it. So the question is, you know, what is work? How can I calculate work? Well, the first thing that we're going to start with is we're going to think about you have a constant force being applied to an object. So let's say work done by a constant force. Well, in this case, uh, we have some object and we're going to imagine that it moves distance D. So an object moves distance D. Um, along, we're gonna imagine that we're in one spatial dimension. So this thing is gonna move along a straight line. So along a straight line. Uh, and it's the, this, action, this movement is the result of being acted on by a force of constant magnitude in the direction of motion. So as a result of uh, being acted upon by a force of constant magnitude, we'll call that F in the direction of motion. Okay, so you can imagine uh, maybe this object is a, a very heavy box and you're pushing this thing in a straight line. And we're going to imagine that you're pushing this for a short enough amount of time that you're not changing the effort that you're using to push this thing, uh, that it's, it's going to remain constant. So you're not really getting tired yet. Okay, so then we define the work. So work, which we will abbreviate by W. So let me just say that's equal to W. This is equal to the force times the distance. So in symbols, this is the force F times the distance D. And Something that is important here, uh, especially when we're talking about physical problems is what are the actual units of this thing? So we can say uh, the units, well, there's two cases. We, we can look at the metric or these are the SI units coming from the French uh, system international uh, or the international system. That's usually referred to as the metric system. And then there's also the, uh, the British system or what's sometimes referred to as the imperial system. So let's start with uh, SI first. So in SI, force is in Newtons. Uh, 
that's abbreviated by capital N. You remember this is kilograms per, per second squared. And then the distance is in meters, which is M. So this tells us work is in what are called Newton meters. So this is kilograms per meter per second squared. And this, this unit, Newton meters, is so important, and this concept of work is so important, that we actually have a short form for this. So much like how Newtons are a short form, uh, we have a short form for Newton meters, which is J, which stands for joules. So you probably encountered this uh, when measuring energy, maybe kilojoules or something like that. So then the, the other case is the British system. I'll refer to that as the imperial system. So for, uh, for the Americans that are watching this, this might be the system that's more familiar to you. Uh, and in this case, forces in pounds. So that's denoted LBS. And distance is in feet. So we'll use FT to denote that. And this tells us that work is measured in, uh, they're, they're referred to as foot pounds. So it's, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just write it because it's, it feels slightly awkward for me to say, but foot pounds. Okay, so, that's fine, right? This is a very, very basic formula. This tells me I can easily calculate the work that's being applied or the, the work that's necessary to move this object, uh, you know, assuming that I have a constant force. But let's go back to my, my original example that I pointed out. You know, maybe I'm pushing this thing and I'm slowly losing energy. I'm getting more and more tired. And so the force is certainly not constant anymore, right? The force is, is decreasing. And so we would expect that um, you know that I'm not going to be able to move the object as far. Or it's going to take a lot more effort for me to do that. So the question is, you know, how do we calculate the work that's actually being done by a non-constant force? So work uh, done by a non-constant force. So let's suppose uh, our distance is going to go over an interval, say A to B. So suppose we have displacement. In one dimension, um, starting at, let's say X equal to A, we use this all the time and ending at x equal to b. So we're gonna use x to denote the one dimension that you're moving in. You're starting at point A, you're ending at point B. Uh, and let's suppose further, the force uh, applied at each x in this interval. So each point in this interval, we can calculate out what the force of this thing is gonna be, uh, is given by a function, we'll say capital F of x. So that's the force at each point in space that you're moving this thing along. Well then the question is, you know, how do we, how do we calculate the work for this object? So let's imagine, the force here now is given by a function. So let's give a little sketch of what this function could look like. And now what we can do is we can do something very, very similar to what we did for the Riemann uh, integral to build up to a proper uh, definite integral. And so we can subdivide this domain. So here's A and let's say here's B. We can subdivide divide the domain and imagine 
that when, the, when each of these little partitions of the domain are small enough, we can approximate the work by a constant function. So let's see what I mean here. Let's say coming up to here, coming over and coming down, we're going to imagine the force is constant on that uh, small rectangle. And again, I apologize for the drawing. I'm going to blame the iPad, but I think 50% is my inability to draw very pretty. Um, but nonetheless, so you imagine, so we, we subdivide the, the interval and we're going to, as always, we're gonna take delta x to be the difference between successive points in the interval. So you can think of this as B minus A over N, the number of per partitions, that's what it always is. And on this interval, XK minus one to XK, we will approximate the force by F of CK where CK is some point in the interval, right? So this is exactly what we do when we do those Riemann integrals or those, those Riemann sums, right? We just pick some point in the interval, we build a rectangle and we say that rectangle has height F at that point. If I used uh, CK is equal to XK minus one, this would be the left rule for building a, a Riemann sum. If I use CK is equal to XK, that would be the right rule. If I use the middle of the interval, that would be the midpoint rule. So it doesn't matter how you set this up, right? Because again, we're, we're always gonna be taking a limit as delta X goes to zero anyways. And I think we could probably see what will happen here. But this tells me, if I, if I move to the next page here, this tells me that the work applied, assuming delta X is very, very small and these, these constant approximations of the function are actually quite close. There's not a whole lot of variation over the interval XK minus one and XK. That tells me that the work is really just the sum of works on each of these constant intervals, right? So we can find the work to displace ourselves from XK minus one to XK. And that's constant, so we can use the previous formula. And then we can find the work to go from xk to xk plus one. Again, it's constant on that, that interval. We can use the formula. Once we find all these, these constant force uh, works that need to be done, we add them all up over the, the whole interval from A to B using these partitions. So this tells me that the work done here is equal to the force of the constant uh, piece inside of that interval times the displacement, which was delta x. And now you can see it, right? This is exactly, um, this is exactly what happens when we have a Riemann sum. So we can say letting n go to infinity, we get that the work here now is equal to, so you have this Riemann sum converging uh, and as n goes to infinity to this definite integral where you are going over your spatial medium, a to b, and you are just integrating the, the force function f with respect to x. So it's literally just a definite integral, right? It's a question of displacement uh, over a medium with a force being acted upon it. And so let me show you an example, right? Let's go for the first example of the day. Let's go back to my, uh, my example of, you know, you're pushing this box or something like that and you're getting tired. So as you, as you push this thing further, you know, I'm starting to get a little winded. It took me a lot of effort to, to get this thing moving. And so, you know, by the time I'm halfway through the interval or something like that, you know, I've, I've lost a lot of my energy and I'm not able to push it with as much force anymore. So let's suppose maybe uh, we get something like this, a force which is equal to maybe one over X squared um, Newtons, so N, but I just wanna write Newtons at the end of that so it's not confusing, uh, is moving an object Maybe you're pushing a big crate or something like that along the x-axis 
uh, from x equal to one to x equal to 10. And so this is exactly the scenario I was just describing. You think about what the, the plot of that function uh, one over x squared actually looks like. You know, it's decreasing uh, as x goes to infinity, it's actually approaching zero. But in this case, we're only going from one to 10. And you can see that the further along this interval you are, less force is being applied. So the question is, you know, what is the work here? Well, the work W in this case is given by the definite integral from one to 10 of one over x squared dx, which we can find the antiderivative of one over x squared. This is of the form x to the power of uh, some n, where n is equal to minus two in this case. So I get minus one over x, that's the antiderivative of this function, and running from one to 10, which is in this case, one over 10 plus one, which is equal to 0 0.9 or nine over 10. And since these are physical problems, we should be careful. We do wanna put the, the actual uh, units in this. So this is 0.9 joules uh, for the work here. Uh, and I knew that it was joules coming from the fact that my force was given in Newtons, right? So we're assuming that the, the x-axis here is, is measured in meters. Okay, so then let's take a look at um, places where we know that, that non-constant forces can arise, and in particular, where we have formulas for this, right? So my, my previous example of me pushing a big heavy crate, it's, it's great, it sounds cute on paper, right? But uh, it's very, very hard for us to measure um, what, look, what that function would look like. So the question is, you know, what are cases where there are actual functions uh, for these forces? And the answer for this comes from uh, one case, at least, is called Hooke's Law for Springs. So Hooke's Law for Springs. So Hooke was a, a physicist. He was actually a contemporary of Isaac Newton at, I believe, Cambridge University as well. Uh, this is in the, the mid to late 1600s. Uh, and so Hooke gave us a, a specific formula that talks about how we can measure the force being applied to a spring if you're going to stretch or compress that thing beyond its, its sort of unstressed uh, natural way that it would sit. So Hooke's law tells us uh, the force required uh, to hold a stretched or compressed um, spring, and this will be X units uh, from its natural. So that would be, it's like, it's unstretched or unstressed length. Uh, is proportional to x. So the further you stretch or compress this spring, the more force is going to be required. And anybody who's played with a spring knows this, right? The further you pull that thing apart, you need to start exerting more force to get it further and further apart. The same thing goes when you're compressing that. And so if we write this actually in symbols, proportional means equal to a constant multiple of. So this tells us force is equal to some K, some constant K times that displacement. And in this case, K is what's known as the spring constant. And if we, if we rearrange um, this equation, we know that force, for example, in the SI units, force is measured in Newtons, um, X is measured in meters, it's a displacement in this case, then that would tell us that the force constant is um, measured by Newtons per meter, right? So it's how much force needs to be exerted per meter of stretching in this case. Now, there's as with you know, most of these sort of classical physics formulas that we learn, 
um, there's some caveats that come into this. And uh, the, the caveat here is this is a very, very good way of approximating the force that's being applied as long as the force doesn't distort the metal of the spring. Okay, and, we're, and so we're going to assume that that's the case. And it, this is a very, very reasonable assumption that we can get away with in practice uh, quite a bit. So let's actually see how this works. Let's imagine, um, you know, let me give you an example and we can very nicely sort of plug this into the formula. Sorry, this is example two for the day. Um, and so in this case, let's say the question asks us to find the work uh, uh, needed or required to compress, ah, sorry, needed to compress a spring uh, from its natural length Uh, of one, uh, we're going to put this in imperial units just so we can see, you know, these things, they, they're, they're the same depending on the units. Um, so a length of one foot to a length 0 0.75 feet. Uh, if the force constant or if the spring constant is given by K equal to 16 pounds per feet. Again, if you just rearrange that F is equal to K times X and you use those Imperial or those British units, uh, you, can, you can very easily see that the spring constant has to be measured in pounds per feet. And uh, I'm out of I've out of uh, room at the bottom of this page. Let me skip to the next page just so I can offer up a drawing so we can kind of see exactly what's happening here. So let me imagine that my spring is anchored at x equal to one. So this is the side that's not being compressed. Sorry. Here's x equal to one. And Let's, the uncompressed spring is one foot long. So X is going to be measured in feet. And so that means that my, my uncompressed spring looks something like this. And then the compressed spring is going to go all the way, or it's going to have a length of 0.75 feet. So if the anchor is at X equal to one, that means that I'm going to come up to 0.25 right here, and that will give me my compressed spring. So I'm pushing from the left-hand side, and now I've got my compressed spring right like that. And so you can see that the, the motion is pushing it like this. So then that tells me that the spatial medium that I'm moving along, the displacement, this tells me that A is equal to zero because that's where I start from on the very left. And I push this thing, I displace the spring all the way up to B is equal to 0.25. And there are other ways to arrange this physically if you want. Uh, if, you, if you want to sort of reorient your drawing in certain ways, uh, that you might be a little bit more comfortable with. That's totally fine. Uh, this is just the way that I chose to do it. Um, and, and again, all that really matters is the final answer. But essentially now we've got everything we need for our formula because we have the upper and lower bounds, zero and 0 0.25. So a displacement of 0.25 feet. This thing is going 16X, that is the force coming from Hooke's law, 16 is the spring constant K, X is the displacement. Remember, I'm using my X axis as my displacement axis. So that means that I'm pushing it in this direction, X. And what this is telling me, again, don't lose sight of the physics here. 
the more I push this, if I increase X, then it's getting harder. I have to exert more force. And that force is, is linear. It's a linear function. It's 16 X, where X is that displacement. So now we've got ourselves a nice, simple, straightforward integral that we need to solve. The antiderivative here is given by 8x squared. And so now we just need to plug in those upper and lower bounds. And this will give us 0 0.5 foot pounds. Oh, sorry. So foot pound. But that's it, right? It's nothing really that laborious, especially if you think about how complicated some of the integrals and some of the questions that we've been forced to ask are. What the primary difficulty with these physics problems are is that you just have to think about how to set the problem up properly. So let me give you another example so we can see how this uh, works in practice. So example three, let's imagine a spring. Uh, it has a natural length. of one meter. So we're back to SI units, just flipping back and forth so we can get used to both if necessary. And a force of 24 Newtons holds the spring stretched uh, to a total length of 1.8 meters. And so I'm going to ask three, three uh, sub questions here. So find the force constant K or find the spring constant. So sometimes people will refer to it as a force constant. That's why I've slipped up a couple of times. So find the uh, spring or force constant K. B, how much work Uh, will it take uh, to stretch the spring two meters uh, beyond its natural length? And see how far uh, will a 45 Newton force uh, stretch the spring? Okay, so just so that we're all on the same page, let's uh, again offer up a very, very, very rough sketch. I emphasize that it's rough, um, but what is it exactly that we're looking at here? We've got a spring, let's say it's suspended vertically. And on the bottom of this thing is a little weight that is pulling us downward. And we can see uh, based on the original question, if this, this weight or this little um, piece that's pulling down at the end of this, this thing is uh, 24 Newtons, or the force being pulled down on this is 24 Newtons, then the total length of this stretch down spring is 1.8 meters. So let's take a look at how we can solve these. In fact, solving part A is really just an application of, um, of Hooke's law. So we know that the force is equal to 24 Newtons. And in this case, we have stretched the spring from one meter to 1.8 meters. So we have a total displacement of 0.8 uh, meters from the unstretched string. So Hooke's law tells us that 24 Newtons is equal to K, the spring constant, times 1.8 minus one. That's the total displacement of this spring. So this gives me 20, uh, sorry, 24K. 
or sorry, 24 is equal to 0 0.8 K, which I can rearrange this thing. I get K is equal to 24 divided by 0 0.8. And this gives me 30 Newtons per meter. Again, we're using SI units. We should be careful. And we always want to include the units when we are doing these physics-based problems. But in this case, now we have what the general forcing function looks like, right? Because the spring constant is exactly that. It's a constant, it's not changing. So this tells us if I want to displace the spring by X units, then I, am, uh, I need to ex exert a force of 30 X. So this spring constant, you can think of this as sort of like the stickiness of the spring. Uh, and, and that's exactly what it's measuring. It's measuring, it's telling you how hard it is to sort of pull this, this spring apart or, or push it together. So now if we look at part B, it says, uh, how much work will it take to stretch the spring two meters beyond its natural length? So in this case, we're going to be, if this is two meters beyond its natural length. So it's originally one meter long. We wanna stretch this thing until it's three meters long, but the total displacement is going to be two meters. We're going from one to three. So in this case, from A, we know F of X is equal to 30 X because the spring constant is 30. And so the work is given by a definite integral from zero to two, zero is unstretched, two is two meters beyond, two meters of total stretching. And then the work function, 30x, and then all dx. In this case, again, it's a linear function we need to take an antiderivative of. So this is nice, right? We can do this. And in this case, now you're left with uh, a fairly easy calculator problem, hopefully, which gives us 60 joules uh, in order to, uh, 60 joules of work to perform this displacement. And then let's take a look, let's wrap this up by looking at the last uh, part here. So the question is, you know, how far will a 45 no Newton force stretch the spring? Well, from Hooke's law, We've got the force, which is 45 Newtons. We've got the spring constant, which is 30. And the only thing that we don't have is the displacement. We need to find the displacement X. So we can rearrange this equation. We get X is equal to 45 over 30 which is the same as 1.5 meters. So what this tells you is that if you took that same spring and you hung a weight on it with a mass of 45 Newtons or the force being pulled down here is 45 Newtons, that spring is going to stretch until it's 1.5 meters long and then it's just going to sit there. And you can think of this as the the weight is pulling it downwards, that, that 45 Newton force is pulling it down, but the spring really wants to stay together. And so it's holding it upwards. So that's, where it, that's why it will sit there and not just be pulled down forever. And again, this is coming through from, from Hooke's law because Hooke's law tells us that the more you try to stretch on a spring, the harder it's gonna be, right? The longer that stretch becomes, well, then a lot of force needs to be exerted on this thing. Okay, so in the, the next few video lectures, we'll continue talking about some of these physical applications and we'll return a little bit to work. But in this lecture, we were able to present what, how we calculate the work of a non-constant force and in particular, what some of these non-constant forces look like coming through from Hooke's Law.